Good evening, everybody. It's uh, 7 o'clock, and we're going to get started. Um, we don't have a very large group tonight, probably because the weather is nice outside. But in any case, uh, we'll get going. You've had a week off, so hopefully you had a chance to uh, practice some of your principles and maybe take a little time off. So uh, let's get into a quick review about what we did last lesson. Lesson number five, we talked about the fulfillment triangle and said that uh, you need success principles, project management, and and so on to uh, be fully successful. We also talked about being motivated from a sense of lack instead of a sense of purpose, and uh, I would encourage you to think about that and continue to think about it. Make sure that you are moving toward things as opposed to uh, trying to fulfill a gap somehow. Uh, there is such a thing, though, as moving away from, moving away from pain or a bad situation and so on, and it turns out that most of the uh, population tends to be motivated by the away from uh, way of thinking instead of toward something. And actually the power comes from being motivated by both, uh, moving away from the undesirable things and toward the desirable. So you may want to think about what it is that you're trying to move away from uh, as well as what you're trying to move toward. We also said that uh, one of the best ways to succeed in life is to express appreciation for everything that you already have because that helps you to get out of a sense of lack all the time. And uh, it also uh, will make you really aware of all the stuff that you really do have. And if you've ever been to a country where people were totally impoverished, I think you would agree that uh, we Americans probably have more things than we really need. We also talked about the effect of TV uh, uh, giving you messages that uh, you're not good in some way, you're not okay in some way. Uh, and I just read something very interesting about those people who have come back from a tragedy of some kind, such as athletes who have been uh, seriously injured. And of course, uh, we've just had a bad situation in Boston where people have lost limbs and if they survive, they're going to have to try to cope with it. And one of the things that they were saying is that instead of comparing yourself to other people, the best thing to do is ask yourself, where am I today? in relationship to where I was yesterday? Am I moving forward? And some of the people that were told they would never walk again have gone into physical therapy with the intention of simply increasing the movement of a limb by two degrees. Just infinitesimally small improvements. And just any little bit of an improvement was enough to show them that they were moving ahead instead of staying stuck. And so. Uh, this is another thing to think about. We said if you look in the mirror and don't like what you see, don't blame the mirror. Ask yourself what you have to do to change, because if you don't like it, you should change it. And we gave you some ideas about using your imagination and the change model, as well as some NLP things. And so hopefully you've practiced some of those things in the past two weeks. And tonight we're going to move into some uh, more NLP techniques. One of the things that I have uh, really thought a lot about is the fact that the success literature tells you that you should use your imagination and you should get rid of limiting beliefs and all those kinds of things. And as I pointed out in a previous lesson, it sounds like they're telling you how to solve your problem, but nobody tells you how you're supposed to get rid of those limiting beliefs. And NLP provides us with uh, some techniques for doing that. And I studied NLP back in the 80s when uh, John Grinder and Richard Bandler were teaching a lot of the classes themselves, and I've been through a couple of classes with both of them, as well as another group in the Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So tonight we're going to talk about changing your mind. We're going to talk about a circle of excellence. That's just two topics that we're going to talk about tonight, and I tell you it may not take the full hour for us to go through the how to do it part, but it's going to require some practice on your part, and I will promise you that if you do this uh, enthusiastically and willingly, 
uh, you will begin to see results. Uh, these techniques have been uh, shown to be very uh, effective and valid. And uh, I guess I should tell you that NLP itself has gotten some bad press because unfortunately they uh, have made some claims that didn't always hold up under scrutiny. I mean, they talk about making a change in 15 minutes that sounds sort of unbelievable to most people. And yet, I told you the story a week or so ago about uh, Joe and Edie, Joe being the fellow that spent all that time in <clears throat> prison. And when he met Edie, uh, completely left all that behind him and changed in, a, in an instant. As a matter of fact, uh, if you've ever had the experience of uh, changing your mind about something, uh, it didn't take you any time at all to do that. Uh, you, one day you were thinking one way, and the next day you thought a different way. And you say, well, that's my mind, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm able to break habits and so on that way. Well, maybe not, but that's simply because we haven't had a technology for doing so. And uh, NLP does provide tools for doing this. And if you get interested in this, I'll recommend uh, a couple of good books for you later on. In the next few sessions, in order for us to get maximum benefit out of what we've talked about, we're going to pay attention to how to achieve goals, how to create strong relationships, because remember, we want to have balance between mind, body, spirit, and relationships and finances. We're going to talk about developing some powerful persuasion uh, strategies and uh, also eliminating fears. So these are some of the things that are going to come in the next few weeks. So here we go. Let's talk a little bit about changing yourself because as we've said before, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. We also said that if you always think what you've always thought, you'll keep on doing what you've always done and you'll keep on getting what you've always gotten. So you do have to change your thinking. Albert Einstein said something to the effect of you can't solve a problem today with the same thinking that created it. And so we have to find ways to get out of our old ways of thinking. Uh, most of us think it's hard to change because we've tried to break habits, particularly habits like smoking or overeating or procrastinating or whatnot. And I can tell you from experience, I've been there. I quit smoking after 15 years, and uh, I, I did that back in 1971 or so, and I haven't touched a cigarette since then. And I was like three packs a day when I was a kid. So it's something that's really hard because there's not only an addiction factor, but there's also a habit factor. And so I know how hard it can be, and yet there are tools and techniques for doing it faster and easier. I'm guessing, too, that some of you are having a little bit of trouble staying motivated, but uh, what's interesting to me is I look at the roster of people who are online. Uh, I can almost tell you that you are the people that are going to make this stuff work because out of 82 people, we lose one or two every week, and uh, there's a core group that is here very, very regularly, and you're it. And so you can give yourself a pat on the back if that'll help. But staying motivated is not easy, especially when, as the old joke goes, you go to the swamp and forget why you're there because the alligators are biting you, and uh, you forget all about draining the swamp. So uh, stay with it. Um, we talked last week about using Kurt Lewin's model uh, to change behavior, where you unfreeze a person, make them realize that, that uh, there is a reason to change in the first place. And then uh, you have to have a new model for how you should behave. You have to try that model and get rewarded for it, which will then tend to refreeze you into new behavior. And uh, the unfreezing part is really difficult for a lot of folks, particularly if they have a habit that has a payback of some kind, and most of them do or we wouldn't keep doing them. Um, procrastinating has some obvious payoffs. You don't have to do unde undesirable things, and in fact, uh, many people that procrastinate do so primarily about things that they just really don't want to do, and sometimes you just have to say to yourself, I'm just going to accept the fact that I really don't want to do that, and I'm not going to do it. And uh, if, if it's not something that's mandatory, you certainly can get by with that. I don't think I'd do it with my income taxes, but uh, other things might work. 
So um, some of the principles of change are that we are actually changing all the time, and as I said earlier, in an instant. But we've got a bunch of myths about change. First of all, that it is difficult, and then we also have this thing about no pain, no gain. And I'm sorry, that might possibly be true in weightlifting, but even then I don't think it's very true because if more pain were more gain, we'd be seeking it out rather than avoiding it. And pain is generally a sign that it's time to change something. If your body starts giving you a lot of grief when you exercise, it's probably telling you that your exercise is doing more damage than you might want to think it is. As a matter of fact, uh, the reason muscle building works is because the body is actually re repairing the damage that you've done to it through the exercise that you've gone through. So um, don't don't fall for some of these myths about oh you got to suffer in order to get better. It just it just simply isn't true. The problem we have is, as I said, we haven't had a technology. We haven't known how to reprogram ourselves. And uh, some of you may even object to that term. It makes you sound as though you're not a human being, that maybe you're some kind of an automaton. And uh, it really isn't meant to be that way. But we do know from brain neuro, uh, neuroscience that the brain rewires itself. and. Uh, they found with people that broke habits that the pathways in the brain that caused them to behave in a habitual way were actually still there. They had not been broken, but what they found in looking at brains was that the pathways had been overridden by a new pathway that was stronger, uh, more intense, and led to a better behavior. And so if we had better ways to reprogram our brains, or in other words, a software for the brain, we'd be able to change our thoughts, actions, and feelings when and how we wanted to. Uh, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good, maybe too good to be true. You'd also be able to change your habits in less than an hour, even after you struggle with them for years. And the NLP people have been proving this for years now because this is uh, about 40 years later after they first started teaching this stuff. Uh, you also could be the way you've always wanted to be. A lot of people dream about being confident, uh, being tenacious or persistent, hanging on when things get rough, being motivated when you need to be motivated, when it counts, as well as being a high achiever, and yet they don't seem to be able to do those things. But you can do all of this stuff. You can do all of this stuff with these tools and techniques, and we're going to learn a couple of them tonight. So let's talk about some of the things that led up to the discovery of techniques in NLP. Until the 1950s, it was believed that skiing was mostly a matter of natural talent. Uh, we believed the same thing about leadership for about 50 years. We thought that leaders were born and not made. And so if you weren't born a leader, you weren't going to be one. By the same token, the skiers thought that if you didn't have the inborn talent, you'd never be a really good skier. But then along came uh, movies, 16-millimeter uh, film, and researchers who liked to uh, record behavior, thing, people in action, and then slow those down and examine them frame by frame. And what they discovered was that there were little, as they call them, isolates, or small units of behavior, which excellent skiers all had. Excellent skiers all had these little isolates, these little units of, of motion. And non-excellent skiers, bad skiers, people that weren't very good at skiing, did not have those same things. OK, so the question is, if all the excellent skiers have these little units of behavior or movement, can we teach those same things to people that aren't very good at skiing? And they tried it, and sure enough, within a very short period of time, these people were performing considerably better than they had started to, to perform. Now, there are other factors involved in how good you're going to get at a sport, uh, physical strength and coordination ability and all that sort of thing. So it didn't totally level the playing field, 
but it did enable people that were mediocre to start getting better fairly quickly. This technique in NLP is called modeling, and it's been used to help people develop skills of all kinds and to change all kinds of behavior. Uh, it's been used in sports, it's been used in music, it's been used in management, it's been used to solve problems of uh, having people having phobias and uh, other kinds of uh, obsessive compulsive behavior and so on. And so modeling is a very, a very robust thing. And in fact, every single one of us has used modeling at some time in our life to learn life skills. If you watch your children, should you have children, or if you watch somebody else's children, you'll see them dress up in adult clothes and get in front of a mirror and play act with each other. You know, our sophisticated grown-up word for that is role-playing. It's skill practice. It's skill building. And uh, children in intuitively do it. And then as we get older, people sort of talk us out of it. And we also become a little bit uh, maybe intimidated to do it. And yet it, mental rehearsal and and getting into a role is one of the best ways in the world to uh, to learn new techniques, new skills, and so on. So we've talked about using the imagination to change. And uh, this is an NLP technique that goes beyond what we've talked about in the past. Now, I've told you that if you can imagine a goal as being already achieved, it's already done, and you can imagine all the feeling, the positive feeling that you would have after you've already accomplished that goal, that that increases the probability that it will happen. Well, we're going to go a little further with that. It turns out that when people visualize things that are really positive for them and contrast that with things that are weaker, the very positive imagination is generally brighter, larger, and closer to you than those things that you imagine that are more negative in, in nature. And so if you take an imaginary scene and it begins being very small, as is shown on the left side of the slide here, little tiny image of this fellow kicking a soccer ball, and you make it larger and brighter and it seems closer to you rather than very far away, then you have just increased the probability that this event, this thing that you've imagined is going to, to help you. Now, that's a way of achieving a positive thing, but what if you want to get rid of something? What if you have a belief that is a negative belief and you'd like to rid yourself of it because we've talked about ridding ourselves of limiting beliefs and indeed you can start with a large scary negative belief, make it smaller, dimmer, and let it go off into the distance. And if you do that several times over a period of several days, you will find that that belief doesn't bother you very much anymore. Now remember, the neural, neuronal pathways in your brain may still be there. But if you simultaneously now imagine yourself with a positive belief instead of that negative belief that was in there and make it bigger, brighter, and closer, what it's going to do is it's going to override the, the negative belief. And so you'll build actual physical neuronal pathways in your brain that essentially will extinguish the old undesirable thing. So, for example, if you grew up in a household where your parents didn't have a lot of money and you might have heard them occasionally say, oh, man, it's hard to make ends meet. We never seem to have enough money to do all the things we need to do. Uh, you may have internalized some of those beliefs or you may have internalized the belief that you're not worthy of money, et cetera, et cetera. So if that's the case, you definitely need to get rid of that belief and this is one of the techniques for doing it. So. I want to point out a couple of things about this slide. Uh, these are stock slides from a, 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 an art service that I subscribe to. And I want you to notice the fellow's eyes. Now, it turns out that 
he is actually in a position with his eyes to access what we call uh, visual constructed images, which is exactly what he should be doing if he's using his imagination to create a scene in his head. If his eyes were over on his left side, which when we're facing the slide means they're on the right hand side, he would be accessing a memory. He'd be accessing visual remembered images. So he is actually intuitively in the correct position to visualize, to imagine something that he wants to experience. Okay, now what good is it to know that? Well, if you have difficulty visualizing something that you want to see, put your eyes up there to your right-hand side, which is my left, looking at the slide, and up toward your head. We have an expression in our language, things are looking up. I think that's a really fascinating thing that we just intuitively know that when things are really going well for us, we tend to look up to see those images in our head. And conversely, we say things are looking down when we're depressed or sad. And if you watch people who are depressed or sad, something bad's just happened, you will find that they will have their eyes looking down. Generally speaking, they'll be down to their right, and they may even be standing or sitting somewhat stoop-shouldered. And these techniques were discovered by the NLP people uh, way back in the 70s. And this is a very robust finding. Uh, you will discover that your children have these patterns very early in life. I will tell you that occasionally a, a left-handed person will be wired, as we say, in a reverse order. So a left-handed person may put their eyes up to the other side of their head. But I find that to be fairly infrequent. It, it turns out from my experience that most people are wired fairly uniformly. So visual constructed, we call it, visual imagination like this is up there to the left. If you're looking at the person or if you're the person doing the, the visualizing, it'll be up to your right. So what I want to suggest that you do, and, and I'm going to have to just kind of let the tape roll, so to speak, for you to do this, I'd like for you to uh, just try this for a moment and see if you can make it work. Imagine something that you would like to experience. Let's just say that uh, something that hasn't happened to you for a while, maybe you haven't had a nice dinner out somewhere or a nice movie to take in or something. Anyway, something that you haven't experienced for a while and you would like to uh, experience that in a uh, near future. See if you can make that image in your head and increase the size of it and increase the brightness of it and uh, I'm going to be quiet and let you just practice with that for just a second. Okay, let's see how many of you were able to do that. If you were able to do that, look over there where it says you can raise your hand and click click the little box where you can raise your hand. You'll see a hand at the very top of it. And let's see how many of you were able to do it. Oh, this is good. I got some good students here. Okay. So it looks like most of you have been able to do it. If you're having difficulty Maybe you're just having difficulty finding a silly little box or the icon or whatever. But if you have any difficulty with it, uh, stick with it. And in particular, be sure to put your eyes up there where you uh, should put them. If you're left-handed and you're having trouble, try putting them on the other side just to see if that works any better. But uh, I'm going to clear the board now. I think I can do that. It uh, doesn't clear it. Oh, okay. There it is. All right. So I've got the board cleared. Okay, so that's a nice way for me to poll and find out what's happening with people. 
Okay, now let's extend this a little bit. Let's take a look at the, uh, the next slide here. Um, I, I want to tell you a little bit, first of all, about some of the presuppositions of NLP because it, it makes a big difference that you understand the basis of everything we're doing. And the first uh, comment here is the map is not the territory. Now that sounds very strange and, and uh, you might not quite follow it, but here's the reason for this expression. We all have beliefs about what the world is like. We, we experience the world and we form mental pictures or concepts in our head, whatever you want to think, that represent the world to us. Now, here's the problem. You've no doubt had the experience of being with a friend and you witnessed something and you started comparing notes and you said, well, that's not how I saw it. And the other person says, well, that's how I saw it. And as a friend of mine likes to say, you both saw the same different event. You actually saw the same event, but you saw it differently. And perception is reality. And so if you see it a certain way, to you that's what, it, that's what it's like. But it's important to understand that the map is not the reality that's out there. And therefore, if we want to make changes, sometimes what we have to do is change the map. And again, that's akin to having to change beliefs. Okay, so that's a that's the first premise. We can't treat the map as though it's the reality. We have to understand that it's a representation of reality. Second premise is that if one person can do something, almost anyone can learn to do it. Now. I put the word almost in there because it's too harsh to say everybody can because people with some physical disability may not be able to. For example, you could teach those little isolates to a ski, uh, of skiing to a person who's uh, suffered a spinal injury and they're not going to be able to learn to ski just by being taught those isolates because there's a defect in their spine that, that they can't overcome. However, this refers to people that don't have any kind of uh, limiting disability. If one person can do something, almost anybody else can learn to do it. Now you say, oh, I've seen people play the violin or the fiddle or the banjo or the guitar or the organ or piano, and I've tried that, and man, I am tone deaf. Well, Ben Zander points out that nobody's tone deaf because if you were, you wouldn't be able to recognize your mother's voice over the telephone. And all of us can do that, and not only can we recognize her voice, we know what mood she's in when she calls. And so nobody's really tone deaf. We may not have equal talent in recognizing pitch differences and things of that nature, but we all can recognize that those pitch differences are there. And given enough practice and given enough uh, modeling, we can definitely teach people to do things that they don't believe they can do. The third bullet, or the third point, I don't have any bullets on here because I don't like bullets very much, but the third point here is that the mind and body are totally interconnected. Now, you may never have thought much about this, but it's like the Pavlovian dog experiment. When you ring that little bell, the dog salivates, okay? So it hears a sound and associates that with food, and just the mental thought of food makes its body start responding by salivating, Gastric juices are secreted in its stomach, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or you go to or, or imagine a scary thing, like you went to see a, a horror movie, and for days after that you can still see some really scary, gory scene. And every time you experience that scary, gory scene, you find yourself with goosebumps or your heart rate increases, your breathing changes, your you know, your skin color changes, et cetera. Your mind and body are totally interconnected. And so we know that people under hypnosis, for example, can be made to uh, experience no pain in surgery and, and childbirth. And we also know that uh, children with warts, you can sometimes say to the child, I'm going to buy that wart, I'll give you a dollar for it, and tomorrow that wart is mine, so you can't have it tomorrow. And sure enough, the kid gets up the next day and it's gone. These things sound incredible to people that have never experienced them, but the power of the mind 
should not be discounted. As a matter of fact, all the pharmaceutical companies are plagued with one thing. It's called the placebo effect. The people in the control group don't get anything but a sugar pill, and yet many of them get well. And that's a contaminant in the research experiment, which just infuriates me when I think about how it's seen as a contaminant instead of saying, man, if that works, we ought to be taking that to the bank. We ought to be promoting that. But there's no money in it for the drug companies. And and uh, if I'm putting them down, that's just too bad because that's the way it is. Um, can't make any money on placebos. But the old country doctors used to know that that was a, a way of working it, and they did. So just keep in mind that your mind will control your body, but the, the effect is the same the other way around. If you find someone who is depressed and they're in that posture I was talking about where things are looking down and they're slumped over and they, they just look like death warmed over, get them up and take them for a walk, get them to ride a bicycle, get them to do anything physical to break the physiology of depression. It's one of the fastest and easiest ways to get someone out of that kind of a mindset. So you can use this both ways if you act as if something is true. For example, if you want to achieve a state of excellence, you need to be standing in the posture of excellence. And we'll come back to that in a moment because that's a signal to your mind that it's supposed to perform really well, and so is the rest of your body. Next premise up here is you already have all the resources you need within yourself. In other words, we have the capability to do anything and everything that we want to experience. We can do, be, and have virtually anything that we can imagine if we are willing to accept that as a, as a reality. The next one is one that I think is a very, very kind premise of NLP. People always make the best choices that are available to them. You know, you say to people, or you say to your friend, why do you think he did that? Well, if you were that person, you would have done it because it was the only choice you felt like you had. Now, you look at it and you say, well, he could have done something else. No, if he could have done something else, he may have. So this really gets us out of being super critical about people. It makes us more forgiving. It makes us more tolerant. It makes us more kind and easy to deal with people. So people always make the best choices. Another way to say it is the best choices that they know how to make. You may say the choice is available to them, but unless a person can accept it, it's not a choice that's available. So, for example, if you say, uh, I got a friend that jumps off a high diving board, boy, and and just looks beautiful when they jump off that diving board, but I can't see me doing that. Well, then you're never going to jump off that high diving board, or if you do, you're going to make a hell of a splash when you hit the water. So that's not a choice that's available to you because you can't conceive of doing it. Last point on the list is if what you're doing isn't working, do something else, anything else almost, anything within reason. Because it comes back to that initial premise. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. So, you know, my mom and dad used to say, well, if at first it, it doesn't work, if you don't succeed, try again. Well, that's okay up to a point. But if you've tried 12 times, um, then it's time to try something else. And as somebody says, the best choices they can perceive, yes, Jim, that's absolutely correct. The best choices that they can perceive. Because if they're sitting there saying, I can't see that happening to me, I can't see me doing that, then there's just not much point in trying because they're not going to succeed. Somehow or the other, they'll be blocked from pursuing whatever it is that they would like to do. Okay? All right, going to give you another technique now. Now, this one is particularly useful for getting rid of those uh, unpleasant memories, those negative beliefs, etc. But it's particularly good for memories. And so if, you, if something happened to you once upon a time that was very unpleasant, it was embarrassing, it was painful, 
And if it's of low to medium intensity, not something that is just absolutely terribly traumatic. For example, I'm going to be totally candid and blunt. If you were raped at some point in time, this is not a technique that's going to help you a great deal because that's too intense. That's too traumatic. So we're talking about issues that are of low to medium intensity here. You begin by watching a movie of that problem situation. That is, you go back through it in your mind. Now, if you don't think you know how to do this, I promise you, you do it all the time. Because just think of a recent incident where you got very upset about something someone else did. And you will realize that for some time after it happened, you kept replaying it in your mind. You kept going over and over it again in your head. We really do know how to do this. This is a skill that everybody has. There's not a human being in the world that does not do this. So watch that movie of the problem situation and feel what you feel because I tell you that whenever you re-experience it, you get the feeling back that you had when it happened. You get pissed at somebody, really angry. You might get sad. You might feel hurt. Whatever the emotion was that you experienced when it happened, you will re-experience that emotion. Now, I want you to think about an upbeat theme of some kind, upbeat music, something that when you hear that music, you feel excited and happy and, and uh, energized, okay? And then I want you to kind of go through that music in your head, hear it playing in your head, if you will, and go back through the movie while that music is playing and, and pay attention to how you feel. And I'm going to be quiet for a moment, and I'm going to let you experience this. Uh, now, if you can't think of a piece of music that's upbeat, I'm going to date myself an awful lot here. But uh, the William Tell Overture, which used to be the theme to the Lone Ranger, I'm not very good at doing that sort of thing, but a lot of people find that to be a, an invigorating kind of a melody. So something of that nature is what you're looking for. So go through your little memory first just to get it in, in your head and see how you feel, and then add the music to it, check the result, and I'll check back with you in just a minute or two. Okay, it's hard to tell exactly how much time people need for this one, so uh, I might not have given you quite enough time, but let's just do a little check. Uh, first question would be, how many of you were able to play the mo movie with some sort of upbeat music? If you were able to do that, raise your hand. Okay, it looks like quite a few of you had some difficulty with that. So 
uh, let me put the hands down. Uh, how many of you were able to play an unpleasant movie? Put your hands up if you were able to play an unpleasant movie. Okay, looks like the same people that uh, were able to play the music were able to do the movie okay. Uh, how many of you are asleep out there? Put your hand up if you're asleep. <laughs> Oh goodness. Okay, let's let's see if I can ferret through this a little bit. Um, some of you may not actually be able to remember a, an unpleasant incident yet, so this might be something that you're going to have to practice in the coming week, and and that's going to be your assignment, by the way, that you practice these methods during the next week. So what you want to do then is you want to pick some situation, um, as it says in the lower paragraph where you may have been embarrassed or hurt or upset in some way um, and practice until you can run the movie without feeling the same thing that you originally felt. Now you have to do that by finding some positive, uh, some positive music, some upbeat music to play along with it. Um, but practice that in the next week, and what you should find is that as you play that music, in fact, for those of you that were able to play the music at the same time that you were running the movie, how many of you found that the feeling had changed for you? Put your hands up if that happened for you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, that's great. That's, that's immediate validation that the technique works. Now the question that some of you are going to have is, yeah, it worked right now, but is it going to last? Well, test it. Go back through it tomorrow and see if it's still about the same intensity or if the intensity is down. If it is back a bit, try it again. Keep doing this for a few times because in some cases, when you when the incident actually happened and you ran the bad experience through your head a bunch of times, you really solidified some of those neuronal pathways. And as I said, you have to let those weaken a bit and then you have to override them with something more positive. And uh, so that, that might take a little bit of time. Okay, so there's uh, the, the next technique. Now this one's going to be the one that, that is going to be absolutely fantastic for you. I've done this for many, many years, and uh, it is a great resource. It's just a great resource. If you have trouble making presentations in front of a group um, or you're up in front of a project team and you need to get their attention and, and come across in a very positive, convincing way, being able to move into what we call the circle of excellence is a technique that you will find invaluable. And so here's how it works. Now, you remember that one of the things that we can do is we can model other people. But it turns out that we can also model ourselves or use ourselves as our model. Because there has been, for most of you, some time in your life where you performed something in an excellent way you were really, really pleased with your performance, with the outcome, with the way you behaved, and so on. And you felt really confident at that time. Now, generally speaking, you'll notice that when a person is feeling confident, they stand very erect, flat on their feet, firmly planted on the, on the floor, and their breathing will be smooth, and they'll feel relaxed and comfortable. They may feel energized, but at the same time, they're not feeling negative tension. And so if there's any tension there, it's going to be positive tension instead of negative. So find some time when you were in that sort of frame of mind and play that movie. Relive that moment, seeing what you saw and hearing what you heard. Now, I need to make an important point here. If when you go through this exercise, you imagine seeing yourself in that position as opposed to seeing out from yourself, 
That's called dissociation. And what you actually need to do is you need to see out from within yourself instead of seeing yourself standing there. That's a much more powerful approach. If you can't do it, don't sweat it. Just go ahead and use the dissociated approach. But it'll be much stronger if you can just relive the ex experience looking out of your own eyes and seeing who's out there and what's going on outside yourself, hearing what you heard then, feeling what you felt then, because that's true reliving the experience instead of dissociating. All right, as you feel that confidence building, imagine that there's a colored circle on the floor that encircles your feet. It could be like there's a spotlight up above you shining down on the floor, and it forms a circle of light all around you. And uh, when you have that very strong feeling, and we won't be able to do this tonight. This is going to be something that you'll have to do after the session's over because I have no way of being able to time this one. But when that feeling is very strong, step outside the circle, leaving the confident feelings inside the circle. Now, you may say, gee, I don't have a clue what that means. Pretend you do. Act as if you do. You'll find it'll work even if you don't think you know how to do it. You will, you will be able to do it just fine. Okay? Now, step number three. Think of a specific time in the future when you want to have that same feeling of confidence. Um, anything that might make you nervous or apprehensive. i got to make a presentation. I'm going in for a job interview. I'm going out on a blind date with somebody that I'd really like to hit it off with because I've had some conversations with them and I think this might be a, a good thing. Whatever it might be, think of a situation where you want to have that same feeling of confidence and see and hear what would be there just before you want to feel confident. For example, uh, we just uh, walked out the door and got in the car or I just sat down in this interview situation. I just walked in this person's office. What would be the cues that you are just about to experience this thing? Next slide. As soon as those cues are clear in your mind, step back into the circle and feel the confident feelings again. Imagine that situation is unfolding around you in the future with these confident feelings fully available to you. In other words, just imagine yourself being in the interview, but you're standing there or sitting there erect with the same feelings of confidence that you had in your circle before you stepped out of it and then stepped back in. Okay, step number five. Step out of that circle again, leaving the confident feelings behind you. And when you're outside the circle, take a moment to think again of that upcoming event. And you'll find that you automatically recall those confident feelings. And that means that you have already pre-programmed yourself for that forthcoming event. Now, if you don't have confidence that one time is enough, then practice it several times. Um, another way to do this, by the way, is to get in front of a mirror so that you can see what you look like. Check out how you look uh, when you're in that excellent position. and once you're in it, then step away from the mirror. Pretend the circle of excellence is right in front of the mirror. Step away from it. And this will give you some visual cues that you wouldn't have unless you were looking in the mirror. These are absolutely wonderful techniques. And uh, I've used this one for a long, long time. I learned it back in about 1984, I think it was. And uh, I was actually teaching an NLP class at the time. Uh, actually a leadership class with a lot of NLP in it. And I showed it to a bunch of people in that class and they couldn't believe it. it just, uh, it's just a fantastic technique. If you try this in the next week and you have difficulty with it, please drop me an email. And uh, if necessary, we'll get on the phone and we'll talk about it. and uh, Or we'll get on uh, Skype or something if you're a long way off and talk about it and see what we can do to help you with it. Because this is going to be a tool, a technique that you can use for the rest of your life for a lot of different things. So we're a little ahead of schedule tonight because uh, this is not a content program tonight as much as it is skills and things for you to work on. Practice these things at least once a day during the coming week. It would be better if you did it at least a couple times a day. And uh, 
Uh, imagine yourself being successful at them. That's another key to the whole thing. See, these things all feed each other. So before you practice this circle of excellence, imagine yourself doing it and imagine yourself being successful, and you'll find that you can very well be that way. There is an NLP book by Steve Andreas, A-N-D-R-E-A-S. If any of you are interested in reading more about NLP, uh, and if you forget it or lose your note, I'll be glad to, again, take an email from you and, and let you know the citation. But uh, it is available for Kindle and also in paperback. So Steve Andreas, uh, they're out in Boulder, Colorado. He's been an NLP teacher for many, many years. So, folks, that's it for tonight. I hope that uh, this is going to be useful for you. I'm really excited to hear how you experience this next week. So drop me a note. Uh, type me a little note in the comments box next week uh, and let me know how this worked for you. And uh, if anybody has a question, since we're a little ahead of time, so I'll uh, pause for just a minute here. If anybody has any kind of a question, just type me a, a note and I'll see. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I hope that uh, all of you are finding the recordings useful. I think that's probably one reason why some people are not at the evening sessions. But uh, in any case, thanks to all of you. Have a great, great weekend, and I'll see you same time, same place next week. Good night.